بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته ان شاء الله we are so we are in the middle of Part 1, Chapter 1, Section 9, for those following in the translation. Just to back up a little bit, a little bit of review here, just to give you some context. Qadi Iyad rahimahullah ta'ala, he quoted from the first 10 verses of Surah number 48, Al-Fatih. And he's commenting upon the descriptions of the Prophet sallallahu in these 10 ayat. And he's quoting from the ulama as well, obviously. So just to repeat here what we said last week, Ja'far ibn Muhammad, he said, part of his completed blessing, so this is a reference to the ayah, وَيُتِمَّ uh, نِعْمَةُ And he, and he uh, completed his blessing upon you. Part of his completed blessing to him is that he made him, that Allah made the Prophet his uh, Habib, Beloved, we quoted the ayah, Ayatul Imtihan, last time, verse 31 of Ali Imran. Swore by his life, La Amruka, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the life of the Prophet وسلم, in the Quran. Abrogated other sharias by him. So the sharia of the Prophet وسلم, is the final sacred law and it abrogates everything that came before it. It confirms the major components and aspects of it, obviously. <clears throat> but is good for all time until the end of time. Raised him to the highest place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We raised your remembrance. Also raised him physically in the Laylatul uh, Isra wal Mi'raj. Protected him in the Mi'raj so that his eye did not swerve nor sweep aside. مَا زَغَ الْبَصُرُ وَمَا تَغَى As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Al-Najm, <clears throat> many of the ulama say this is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam experienced the ru'ya, the beatific vision, when he, when he gazed upon the countenance of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. And there's some difference of opinion about that. Um, sent him to all mankind, he's going to quote these ayat later, and made booty lawful, here booty means ghanima, war booty, for his community. He also made him an accepted intercessor, um, Shafi'a, Shafi'ullah, uh, and the master of the descendants of Adam, which is a reference to the hadith in Tirmidhi, Anasayyidu walidi Adam wa la fakhr, that we quoted earlier, that he quoted earlier. He coupled his name with his own name, here in like in the Adhan, in the Iqama, in the Shahada, and his pleasure with his pleasure seems to be a reference to the verse in the Qur'an, وَاللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَحَقُّ أَنْ يُرْضُوهُ Allah and His Messenger, it is more befitting that you please them. Meaning, pleasing, uh, pleasing the Prophet ﷺ is the same as pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their pleasure is the same. He made him one of the two pillars of Tawheed. Again, a reference to the Shahada. When we say the Shahada, لا إله إلا الله. So, لا إله that's, that's atheism. There is no God. Illallah. This is now um, uh, theism, belief in God, or could be even construed as a type of deism, that there is a God, he's a creator, but he's not necessarily a personal God. So this is more of sort of an Aristotelian, Platonic God. But then Muhammad Rasulullah, this is theism. This is now God. This God is now personal uh, by sending, uh, by um, uh, by, by sending human messengers to mankind for their guidance and revealing scriptures. Allah then continues, those who pledge allegiance to you, make bay'ah to you, actually pledge allegiance to Allah. Meaning in the pledge of Ridwan. So we mentioned this, bay'ah to Ridwan, right? At Hudaybiyah. That the Prophet Sallallahu he sent um, uh, Uthman to negotiate with the Meccans, then a false report had reached him that Uthman had been murdered by the Mushrikeen. And so the Prophet وسلم, he sat under a tree and took pledges of allegiance uh, from the companions. 
and this is where we left off last time, that Ibn Kathir and Imam al-Qurtubi, they say that the pledge was that they would fight with the Prophet ﷺ until death. That they were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for the sake of the deen. And here Ibn Ajiba says, the next statement in the Qur'an contains the greatest praise of the Prophet ﷺ in the entire Qur'an. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yadullahi, Yadullahi fawqa aidihim, that the Yad, which is sometimes translated as hand, the hand of God is over their hands. They pledge allegiance to Allah when they pledge allegiance to you, to the Prophet So Qadi Ihad, he says here, this metaphorically refers to the power of Allah. So this is known as one of the ayat mutashabihat. There's certain verses in the Quran that are anthropomorphic, right? Um, these ayat must be anchored theologically in transcendence, in tanzih, in order for us to understand them properly. And the theological anchor of the Quran is Surah 42, verse 11. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ there is nothing like the likes of God while he is all hearing and all seeing. There's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatsoever. So the yad of Allah has nothing to do whatsoever with a created or human hand. Right? It has nothing to do whatsoever. Laysa kamithlihi shay'un. There's nothing like him whatsoever. مَهْمَا تَصَوَّرْتَ بِبَالِكْ فَاللَّهُ لَا يُشْبِهُ ذَلِكْ That whatever the human imagination can possibly imagine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely different than that. So the practice of the early Muslims, called the Salaf, like the Sahaba and the few generations after them, is to just consign the meaning of these ayat mutashabihat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they wouldn't... Uh, uh, they wouldn't um, uh, interpret these ayat. They would simply consign the meaning to Allah. They would say that this means whatever is whatever Allah intends it to mean, whatever is appropriate to His greatness and majesty. There's nothing like Allah whatsoever. They wouldn't attempt to interpret the ayat. Later scholars from the Khalaf, the later generations, they would actually interpret these ayat because now there is a need, because now you have deviant groups taking these ayat and teaching uh, deviant theology, saying things like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a physical hand, he has physical fingers, he's located in a physical space, things like this. So this provoked the ulama of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah to begin to interpret these ayat. So they would make ta'wil. It's tafweed. Tafweed means that they would consign the meanings to God. Tafweed with a dad. And then ta'wil. Ta'wil means that they would interpret the ayat, but still in the light of God's transcendence. Right? So they would say that, um, that the first is kind of a three-step process. The first step is to, to detach any type of, any, any notion of physicality to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then they'd interpret it and say, Yadullah means the power or protection of God, uh, and then they'd affirm transcendence and affirm that Allah knows, that Allah only knows. Laysa kemithlihi shay'un wallahu alam. Right? So this is what he's doing here. This metaphorically refers to the power of Allah, Yadullah, or the protection of God. There's a hadith that says, Yadullahi, uh, yadullahi ma'al jama'ah, or ala al jama'ah in another riwayah that the yad of Allah is with the majority. So the ulama say the meaning of this, those who make ta'wil of the hadith, the meaning of this is that, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, protection is with the majority. So he says, this metaphorically refers to the power of Allah, his reward, his favor, or his contract, and strengthens the act of their pledging allegiance to him and exalts the one to whom the allegiance is given. Okay, these words of Allah are similar to, and then he quotes here from Surah Al-Anfal, you did not kill them, and this is in the plural, this is a reference to the Battle of Badr. So it's addressed to the, the Sahaba, um, 
as to what they did on the battlefield. You did not kill them, but Allah killed them. And now the next sentence is in the singular, addressed specifically to the Prophet You did not throw when you threw, but Allah threw. So this was a reference to an incident at the Battle of Badr with the Prophet uh, He picked up some, some pebbles and he just sort of threw them in the direction of the mushrikeen. Um, so Allah says, you did not throw when you threw, but Allah threw. All of the actions of the Prophet ﷺ have tawfiq. They're all according to the ridwan, the good pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of his actions are guided. He's in a state of union with Allah's ridwan. Um, Ibn Arabi points out something interesting here. He says that in this statement, there's an explicit negation followed by an explicit affirmation. You did not throw when you threw, right? Well, So he says that this demonstrates both Allah's transcendence as well as his nearness to the Prophet Sallallahu That the Prophet Sallallahu or anything in creation for that matter is not Allah. Yet the Prophet's action was in reality Allah's action. Allah is a doer of every action. How Allah willed that action, he created that action, and he was pleased with that action. So the Prophet ﷺ is a means by which Allah carries out his well-pleasing will uh, in the world. So these are, these are very, very exalted ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is is <clears throat> pronouncing here with respect to the Prophet Sallallahu demonstrating a very close, exalted state of union that he has with the Prophet Sallallahu Not union on the level of essence or ontology, right? Um, that's the Christian position with regards to Isa Alayhi And this is a, a, a problematic, dangerous position to have. It's not according to our sound aqidah. Okay, so then he says, however, whereas the former is metaphorical, so he's talking about here, yadullahi fawqa aidihim, that's metaphorical, it's, he says majaz, figurative, the latter is literal, you did not throw when you threw, but Allah threw, it's literal truth, since the, in the latter case, the killer and the thrower was in reality Allah, he was the creator of the prophet's action, his throwing, his power to do it, and his decision to do it, no man has the power to throw. And then here he mentions something that uh, Imam Razi also mentions, that the, the Prophet Sallallahu he took the pebbles and he just kind of lobbed them in the direction of the mushrikeen. The mushrikeen are very far off, but somehow miraculously uh, dust, a dust particle was able to infiltrate the eyes of every single one of the mushrikeen. Uh, so Imam Razi mentions that this was in reality a rare occurrence of natural law. Right? So um, it's not natural for a human being to be able to do that. Allah threw. Section, okay, that's the end of the section nine. This is the last section of chapter one, part one. How Allah in his mighty book demonstrates the honor in which he holds him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his position with him uh, and other things which Allah gave him. So he says, some of this is contained in what Allah says about the night journey in the surah of the same name, and surah entitled the star, and najm, which refer directly to his incomparable station and nearness to Allah uh, and the wonders he witnessed. A further demonstration is a fact that uh, he is protected, the Prophet Sallallahu is protected from people. So here he quotes Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 67, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. And Allah protects you from the people. So in fact, 12, 13 or so assassination attempts were made on the Prophet sallallahu Now when this ayah was revealed, according to the Mufassirin, the Prophet sallallahu was on a journey and he came out of his tent and he dismissed all of his guards Allah told him, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. Allah protects you from the people. When those who were reje uh, when, uh, and also he quotes, 
when those who reject were plotting against you to confine you or kill you or expel you and were plotting and Allah was plotting. Right? So the sort of last straw or the last stand, I guess you could say, for the Mushrikeen in Mecca, they met at the Darul Nidwa, which is like their city council. This is after the death of Abu Talib, whose seat is now vacant. Some of the books of the Sirah say that there was a man sitting in his seat who was dressed in black. He was sort of hooded. And uh, this man said, let's just kill him. Let's just kill the prophet. Right? And then Abu Jahl said, that's a good idea. So he, he hired uh, one youth from every clan to stand by the stand outside the, the, the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, the, the, uh, the ulama say that uh, the sheikh that was there dressed in black was shaitan, an incarnation of the shaitan. Uh, so they stood by the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in order to kill him. He's going to mention that in a minute here. So, and then he quotes this verse from Surah Tawbah. Uh, if, you, if you do not help him, yet Allah has helped him. So he says, Allah averted the harm of his enemies from him when they conferred secretly about him and plotted to kill him. He took their side away when the prophet went out past them. So the assassins, he's, he was referring to the story mentioned in the Sirah that the assassins were outside of his door. Sayyidina Ali was in the house and the prophet وسلم, told him to lie down in his bed. And the prophet simply opened the door and walked right past the assassins. He was reciting Yasin at the time. That uh, we, we veiled them so that they do not see. <clears throat> and then he caused them not to look at him in the cave. So this is mentioned in our tradition that the Prophet وسلم, was in the cave during the Hijrah with Abu Bakr Siddiq. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا So Abu Bakr Siddiq, um, he had some uh, fear and trepidation, not for himself, but for his sahib, for the Prophet ﷺ, his companion. So there was a man standing right at the entrance of the cave, and they can see him. And Abu Bakr said, if this man would just look at his feet, he'll see us. So the Prophet Sallallahu he said, La tahzan. He said, don't be afraid. Inna Allah ma'ana. Allah is with us. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the creator of all actions. He's the willer of all actions. Allah did not will this man to simply move his eyeballs down and look at them. Allah is in control of everything. And then uh, the ayah continues. This is Surah Tawbah, verse 40. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down his sakina, his peace, his tranquility upon him. Imam al-Razi suggests that the pronoun here, alayhi, is a reference to Abu Bakr. That tranquility was sent down upon Abu Bakr. But then the next statement, وَأَيَّدُهُ بِجُنُودٍ And he helped him now the pronoun is the Prophet Sallallahu He helped him with junood, hosts or armies, uh, supporters that you did not see. Or they say both of the pronouns refer to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Allah Subhanahu is mentioned in the, in the seerah as well that a spider had spun its web at the mouth of the cave, there was a dove building its nest, that these are the part of the junood. These are the soldiers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protecting his habib. Something as flimsy as a spider's web. Right? He's protecting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Demonstrating that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these things are easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do. <clears throat> and then he says, the signs connected with that, the sakina tranquility which was sent down on him and the story of Suraqa bin Malik are all mentioned by the people of Hadith and Sirah in connection with the story of the cave and the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu to Medina to Munawwara. So Suraqa bin Malik, he mentions a very famous story when the Prophet Sallallahu was uh, leaving uh, Mecca with Abu Bakr Siddiq. The, the Meccans, they put a bounty on him, 100 nuk, 100 she-camels, dead or alive. So this man Suraqa bin Malik, 
who was a, a, a master tracker. Uh, he was able to find them very quickly in the desert, just following the tracks. And he said, I looked and I saw one of them. He was sitting on his conveyance and his hands were up like this and he was saying something to the heavens. And then the other one was doing circles around him and he kept looking back at me. So uh, he said, I charged and suddenly I fell from my horse and I've never fallen. So he gets back on and he charges again. He falls a second time. He falls a third time and now he's within earshot of the two men. So then... Uh, the Prophet ﷺ engages him in a conversation. He says, why have you come? And he says, I've come for a hundred camels. Can you give me something better? And the Prophet said, yes, I can give you something better. And he says, Kefa bika ida labista siwara kisra. How will it be for you when you wear the bangles, the bracelets of kisra? And of course, Surah Qabin Malik is just, just a simple man. He said, who is kisra? And he said, kisra is Malikul Faris. He's the king of Persia. He's like, the king of Persia. So he knew the Prophet Sallallahu is a sadiq al amin He's not going to lie. There's no, this is out of the question that he would lie. So he said, can you write it down for me? So he said to Abu Bakr, write this down. So he took a little sahifa and they wrote down that on such and such a day, the Prophet Sallallahu promised the Suraqah of the son of Malik that he's going to wear the bracelets, the siwar of, Kis siwar of Kisra. And as the story goes, uh, he goes back to Mecca, and the Meccans probably made fun of him, right? Uh, but then years later, the Prophet Wasallam passes. Abu Bakr Siddiq is the caliph. He passes. Sayyidina Umar is now the caliph. And the Muslims, they conquer Persia, the Battle of Qadisiyah, um, under uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And the Ghanima of Persia is in the Masjid in Medina the treasures of, of Persia and the bangles of Kisra are, are there. And by this time, Surah bin Malik has converted to Islam and he's a, he's a companion and he's in, he's in Medina. So Sayyidina Umar, he has the Sahifa. And so he calls up Surah bin Malik to the front and he reads it off. And then he places the bangles on the arms of Surah bin Malik. And the crowd is shouting, Sadaqa Rasulullah, Sadaqa Rasulullah. Um, so this is what he's referring to here, Surah bin Malik, the famous story. <clears throat> Allah also says, we gave you kawthar, inna a'atayunak al kawthar. So pray to your Lord and sacrifice, the one who hates you, he's the one who's cut off. Surah al-Kawthar, only three ayat. Allah told him about what he had given him. Kawthar is from kathara. It's an emphatic noun. Fawal kawthar. It's the only occurrence of the word in the entire Quran. Um, so you have to go to the hadith to understand the word. Kawthar is said to refer to his basin, according to the uh, Mufassirin, the hawd of the Prophet وسلم, which most say is after the sirat, just outside uh, the Jannah. It is also said that it is a nahrun fil jannah, that is a river actually in jannah. Abundant, they also said it means different, kawthar means just abundance, a lot of abundance, abundance and abundance. <laughs> Kathir means a lot, but kawthar is emphatic, a lot of abundance. So it can also mean the shafa'a, the mu'ajizat, the nabuwa, the ma'rifa, different things. Then Allah replied to his enemies for him and refuted what they had said by the words, In Nashani Akahual Abtar. The one who hates you, he's cut off, meaning your enemy, and the one who despises you. Cut off means poor, abased, or left all alone, or one with no good in him at all, or even something like forgotten to history, or maligned throughout history. And of course, one of the meanings of Kothar also is uh, a reference to a Sayyidah Fatima Zahra. And this is mentioned, this is usually because um, she's sort of the fount of the Ahl al-Bayt. Right? Um, this is usually mentioned by Shiite uh, Mufassirin, like Imam Tabrisi mentions this, and many other Sh Shiite Mufassirin, but some Sunnis also mention it as well. And, and it works well with the, with the context, because the Asbab al-Nuzul of the Surah is that this 
mushrik named Al As ibn Wa'il was making fun of the Prophet وسلم, because the Prophet's male children died in infancy. So he said, You're cut off, your your progeny's done. No one's gonna remember you after you die. <laughs> this is what he's telling the Prophet. The man whose uh, whose whose name is the most popular name in the world, right? The man whose name is being extolled. 24-7, uh, every day until the Yom Al-Qiyamah. Somebody is saying the Shahada right now. Somebody is pronouncing the Adhan. And they're using his actual name. Because people say, well, you can say the same thing about Isa, alayhi salam. But there's some people saying Isa. There's some people saying Yeshua. There's some people saying Jesus. There's some people saying Jesus. They're using different names. But everyone is saying Muhammad. It's the same name. So then this person says, no one's going to remember you when you die. Right? So... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we've given you kawthar. And so the ulama say, one of the meanings of kawthar is Fatima Zahra. And the Ahl al-Bayt comes from her. And this is from the Khasa'is. We mentioned this in the other class, I think. Or maybe we mentioned it here. That from the Khasa'is of the Prophet sallallahu from the special qualities of the Prophet sallallahu is that his Ahl al-Bayt comes from his daughter. Sayyidina Ali is not his son. Ahl al-Bayt starts with his daughter. And she, obviously she's married to Sayyidina Ali. Okay. And, you know, volumes have been written on just this Surah Kawthar. Then Allah says, We have given you the seven Mathani. This is what he quotes next. This is from Surah Al Hijr, Ayah 87. وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِي وَالْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِيمِ we have given you the seven mathani. Mathani means something that's repeated. And the immense Quran. It is said that the mathani are the first long surahs. And that the immense Quran refers to the Ummul Quran. Ummul Quran meaning Al Fatiha. So this is mentioned by Imam Al Tabri, Imam Al Zamakhshari. They mentioned that. That the Mathani, the seven Mathani, refer to the first seven long surahs of the Quran. That's one opinion. It is also said that the seven Mathani are themselves the Ummul Quran, Al Fatiha. And that the immense Quran means the rest of the Quran. And this is also mentioned by Imam Al Tabari and Zamakhshari, Ibn Ajiba. Imam Al Razi actually mentions a hadith of the Prophet. Uh, in which um, he, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, refers to al-Fatiha as as sab'ul mathani, the seven oft repeated. There's a hadith like this. I didn't write down the book of hadith. I forgot to do that. But it's a good hadith, a strong hadith. <clears throat> All right. And there's other opinions also. What are these sab'a min al-mathani? It is said that the seven Mathani refers to the awamir and the nawahin, the sort of commands and prohibitions uh, of the Quran, the good news and warnings, the metaphors and enumerations of blessings, um, different opinions. It is said that the Ummul Quran is called Mathani because it is said at least twice in every prayer. So Ummul Quran, according to the hadith, is another way of saying Al Fatiha, the mother of the Quran, the essence of the Quran, the core of the Quran. It is said that the Ummul Quran is called Mathani because it is said at least twice in every prayer. Right? So the, the minimal prayer is two rak'atin. So you're going to say the Fatiha twice. It is said that Allah set it aside for the Prophet وسلم, and stored it up for him rather than other prophets. He called the Quran Mathani because the stories are repeated in it. It is said that the seven Mathani means we have honored you. So there's another opinion. We have uh, we have honored you with seven marks of honor. The Prophet وسلم, has seven marks of honor that are mentioned in the Quran. Guidance, huda, prophecy, nabuwa, mercy, rahma, intercession, shafa'a, friendship, wilaya, and esteem, like izza or rifa, and tranquility, sakina. Seven marks of honor. So there's different opinion. Uh, there's different opinions about what is this sabr uh, al But the strong opinion, because it's supported by hadith explicitly, is that it's a reference to al-Fatiha. There's seven ayat in al-Fatiha. 
Allah says, we sent down the dhikr to you that you might make things clear. وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ And we sent down a dhikr, the Qur'an, one of the names of the Qur'an, a dhikr, in order for you to explain to the people what has been sent down. So then the prophetic words, the sunnah, is absolutely imperative. The prophetic commentary of the Qur'an. And then he quotes here, that's from Surah Nahal, by the way, verse 44, famous verse 1644. Then he quotes here 3428, Surah Saba, I believe it, verse 28. We only sent you, so, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكِ إِلَّا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا We only sent you to all people as a, br a bringer of good news, Bashir and a Nadir, and as a warner. These are titles of the Prophet ﷺ that we've talked about in the past. And then he finally quotes this ayah, Surah Al-A'raf, verse 158. O oh people, I am the messenger of Allah to you all. So he's saying here, why is he quoting these ayat? He says this is one of the special favors he has granted. Again, from the khasa'is of the Prophet ﷺ. Allah says, we only sent a messenger with the language of his people to make things clear. Allah specifies their peoples, but he sent the Prophet to all people. And he said of himself, the Prophet said, I was sent to all mankind. This is stated in numerous hadith. The wording in Sahih Muslim, Ursiltu ila al I was sent to the creation, everything, all of creation. So in other words, again, the sharia of the Prophet there's no, there's no more rusul, there's no more anbiya, there's no sacred law yet to be revealed. The sharia of the Prophet is the final sacred law revealed. Right? So that's why he's the final messenger, that's why he's the universal messenger. And as we said, the sharia of the Prophet ﷺ is a confirmation of the foundational principles of all of the sharia before him. So, Nuh ﷺ received the sharia. And then, um, uh, Musa ﷺ, uh, sorry, Ibrahim ﷺ, Sharia 2.0, Musa Islam, the Torah, Sharia 3.0, Isa Islam 4.0, and then finally 5.0, the Quran. And that's it. That's the, the latest. No more updates. <laughs> of course, there's touch deed. There's, you know, there's ijtihad, right? With the ulama, the scholastic community. But those foundations never change. All right. <clears throat> and then he quotes here a beautiful ayah, Surah Al Ahzab, verse number six. He says, An Nabi Yu Aula Bil Mu'minina Min Anfusihim wa Azwajuhu Ummahatuhum. The Prophet is nearer or closer, Aula, closer to the believers, Min Anfusihim, than their own selves. The Prophet is nearer and dearer to the believers than their own selves. And his wives are their mothers. The commentator, commentators say that nearer to the believers than their own selves means uh, that they must do whatever he commands, just as a slave must carry out his master's commands. It is said that it is better to follow his command than to follow one's own opinion. His wives are their mothers means that they enjoy the same respect as mothers. They cannot be married to anyone after him. This is a mark of honor to him and a special favor. Again, from the Qasais of the Prophet ﷺ, it is also because they are his wives in the garden. He says here, an unusual reading of this ayah. So this is a shad reading. It's an anomalous reading. It's unreliable. But he quotes it because it has the strength of a hadith, so it's true in its meaning. 
but it couldn't be uh, established through multiply attested measures. Um, that the ayah says, "An Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim huwa abu lahum." The Prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves. He is their father. Wa azwajuhu mahatuhum, and his wives are their mothers. So it's true in meaning. He is preeminently our spiritual father. Um, Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran is called our father. Millata abikum Ibrahim. And the Prophet وسلم, is better than Ibrahim alayhi salam. So he's saying it's no longer recited because it's at variance with the version of Uthman, the Uthmani Codex. So it's, uh, it has the strength of a, a hadith. Allah says, Allah sent down on you the book and wisdom. This is Surah An-Nisa, verse 113. Allahu alayka al-kitab wal-hikmah. Kitab wal-hikmah. You always see this coupling, this juxtaposition of al-kitab wal-hikmah. Not always, but many times in the Quran. We sent down upon you al-kitab, the Quran, wal-hikmah. And according to many ulama, hikmah in the Quran means sunnah. The Quran's preeminent ethical application. And notice that Allah says here, وَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ والحكمة, that Allah revealed that as well. He sent it down literally. Anzala means to send something down. That he, re, that he revealed not only the kitab, but the sunnah. The Prophet Wasallam's exemplary, authenticated sayings and doings are revelation. And in, also in this ayah, he says, وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا uh, Allah's overflowing favor to you is immense. It is said that his immense favor refers to prophethood or what he already had in pre-eternality. al wasiti said that it indicates his ability to bear the vision, the ru'ya, which Musa salam, uh, could not bear. Allahu alam. But going back to this uh, ayah at the beginning here, 33.6, an nabiyu awla bil mu'minin min anfusihim. That the Prophet is more beloved to the believers than their own selves. So usually when this ayah is quoted, the ulama quote the famous hadith in Bukhari, uh, nafsi bi yadi, I swear by the one who has my soul in his yad, la yu'midu ahadukum hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min walidihi wa waladihi wa nasi ajma'in. That uh, none of you have complete faith until I am more beloved to him uh, than his, his uh, parents, his children, and all of humanity. And there are numerous, uh, numerous hadith and statements from the Sahaba, stories of the Sahaba that demonstrate that the Sahaba truly um, uh, walk the walk as far as this ayah is concerned. Sayyidina Ali, he said, Kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ahabba ilayna min kulli shay'in wa min al ma'il baridi ala dhama. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was more beloved to us than every shay. Shay means created thing. Sha'a means to Sha'a is to something that's willed into existence, right? So this does not include the Creator. The Prophet ﷺ is, was more beloved to us than anything in creation, even more so than cold water when we're thirsty. So the analogy here, the Arab, the desert Arab gets it, that, that cold water is, is life itself, right? <clears throat> of course, the famous story in Kitab al-Maghazi, al-Waqidi mentions the, the martyrdom of Khubayb ibn Adi, when he was taken to Tan'im by the Mushrikeen after the Battle of Badr. And uh, they, were, they basically were going to crucify him and then impale him. And there's other things that say they, they cut off his body parts and things like that. Uh, but they said to him, don't you wish you were at home with your family and, uh, and Muhammad was in your place? And Khubayb said, I don't wish that a thorn prick the finger of, of the Rasul. Right? And so he said, before you kill me, can I pray raka'atain? Can I pray, you know? And they said, yeah, you can pray. So they let him pray, and then they turned him from the Kaaba. Right? And then he quoted, fa'inama, uh, what is the verse? Walillahi um, al-mashriqu wal-maghrib fa'inama tuwallu fathamma wajhullah inna Allah wa asiyun alim. So he quoted the ayah um, that um, to Allah belongs the east and the west. Whichever way you turn, you'll, found, you'll find the countenance of God. 
uh, and so and so they they basically crucified him and then they stabbed him uh, and then he said that there's no one here to convey my salams to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so um, Al-Waqidi says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in Medina he's sitting with some companions Zayd ibn Haritha and others and then suddenly it seemed like the tanzil descended upon him and he said wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi ya hubayb and they said what happened and he said our companion is being martyred right now in Mecca and then Abu Sufyan ibn Harb who was there he wasn't Muslim at the time obviously he saw this entire thing happening and he said ma ra'aytu ahadan yuhibbu ahadan kuhubbi ashabi muhammadin muhammadan he said i've never seen anyone love anyone like the companions of muhammad love muhammad <clears throat> There's many other things. Sahih Muslim mentions Abu Ayyub al Ansari, a great lover of the Prophet. When the Prophet came into Medina to Manawara, he stayed at the residence of Abu Ayyub al Ansari for seven months. And Abu, Abu Ayyub had a two story house, as it says in Sahih Muslim. And so the Prophet said, I'll take the ground floor because it's easier. People are going to visit me. I'm going to be leaving a lot. And they said, Fine. So Abu Ayyub and his family were on the second story. And then like a, a few days later or the, that night or something like that uh, Abu Ayyub he's, he's quoted in the hadith he said he said to his family Nam shi ra'si Rasulillah. He said, do you realize we're walking over the head of the Prophet uh, so uh, he, the hadith says Fabatu fi janibin. so they they huddled into a corner uh, of the room upstairs like into one of the corners because they knew that the Prophet's um, mat was in a certain place downstairs so they made sure that they were on the other side and then they would sort of shimmy against the walls they didn't walk across the room because they would consider it bad adab to walk over the head so then Abu Ayyub he came back down and he said uh, we're walking over your head and the Prophet said that's okay don't worry about it. this is easier for me to, to be here and he said no I insist <laughs> so he said, okay so they switched places so the Prophet said I was on the second floor and then the hadith says that they would bring him food and the Prophet would leave a little bit of food and then Abu Ayyub and his wife would look at the dish and try to determine where the, the Prophet's hand had touched the plate and they'd eat from that spot for tabarruk uh, and then one time there was a there was a, a plate that came back and it wasn't touched at all right and so Abu Ayyub he said oh what happened you know there's something wrong with the food and then he said that there's garlic in this food. And I, I don't eat garlic because I have conversations with malaika. And whatever bothers uh, humanity bothers the malaika. Right? So then Abu Ayyub, he said, uh, I, I detest whatever you detest. So there's no more garlic in the house. So the ulama actually say, from, based on this hadith, that, that eating garlic is mubah, it's permissible. But it's makru if you're going to speak to dignitaries, to, to kibar, right? To like very prominent people. <clears throat> of course, there's a hadith, the famous hadith in Tirmidhi, uh, where Aisha says that, that she approached Fatima Zahra and she said to her that, I noticed once that you were standing, like sort of standing over the Prophet ﷺ when he was in his final illness and you leaned in close suddenly and you started crying and then you leaned in again and he started laughing and she said, Aisha said, I've always wondered what did he tell you? What did he, can you please tell me what did he tell you? Um, so Fatima says, أَخْبَرَنِي أَنَّهُ مَيِّتٌ مِنْ وَجِعِهِ had that. Fabakaitu. He told me that he's going to die from his illness. So I cried. Thum akhbarani anni asra'u ahlihi luhuqan bihi. Fadaka hina the hiktu. She says that then he told me that I would be the first of his family to join him in death. And she died a few months later, some six months later. So I laughed. Right? So She was a very young woman. How old was she? In her 20s maybe? Something like that. Very young. But she's happy she's going to die because she's going to be with her father. Right? 
So this is a type of love that most people just, they don't get it, right? They don't understand what's going on here. And part of the problem is just this dunya, just entrenched in the dunya. You know, people think they're going to live forever. People, they put things off. People just want immediate gratification. And they, and they just, what is that? That's a long time from now, if it even happens. The akhirah could be tomorrow, if you die now, and you're in your grave, it passes like a night of sleep, and tomorrow is Yom al -Qiyam. Literally tomorrow for you could be Yom al -Qiyam. But not something far off. You know, death comes uh, suddenly without warning, can come to anyone. Just something we learn from the death of a, like a sports star, a celebrity, like the death of Kobe Bryant, something that we can learn is that death does not discriminate. You could be at your peak, you can be at your, you can be with your kid somewhere and death comes and both are gone. So that's actually the end of Chapter one. Any questions so far? Comments? <clears throat> Just take a drink real fast and then we can start chapter two. We have a few minutes. <clears throat> I, I would say probably one of the greatest examples of the Prophet's awla, the Prophet's uh, nearness to the, to the Sahaba over their own selves is Ghazwat Badr. Just read what happened uh, at Ghazwat Badr. They would put themselves totally in harm's way uh, to protect the Prophet And there's many examples of, of that. <clears throat> Chapter 2 is called Allah's Perfecting His Good Qualities of character and constitution and giving him all the virtues of the deen in this world. So I'll, I'll read you, it's a short introduction and then I'll just give you some of the highlights because it's, it's a little bit, um, uh, um, a, little, a little confusing I guess you can say here. So whoever loves a noble prophet and is searching out the complete details of his inestimable treasure of his being should know that man's beautiful and perfect qualities can be placed in one of two categories. Number one, characteristics which are innate and a necessary part of life of this world, such as natural form and things connected to the necessary acts of daily life. Number two, characteristics which are acquired as part of the deen. These are things for which one is praised and which bring one near to Allah. These qualities can be further divided into two categories. Qualities which are purely innate or acquired. And number two, qualities which combine both elements. Then he goes on, man has no choice in or ability to acquire innate qualities. These include things like perfection of physique, physical beauty, strength of intellect, soundness of understanding, eloquence of tongue, acuteness of the senses, strength of limb, balance, nobility of lineage, the might of one's people, and the honor of one's land. Also connected to this are the things that are the necessities of daily life, such as food, sleep, clothes, dwelling place, marriage, property, and rank. These things, however, can be connected to the next world if the intention in them is related to fear of Allah and teaching the body to follow the path of Allah, in spite of the fact that they are all defined as necessities and governed by the rules of the Sharia. As for the acquired things which pertain to the next world, they include all virtues and the adab of the Sharia, making things, things such as practice of the deen, knowledge, forbearance, patience, thankfulness, justice, Doing without humility, pardon, chastity, generosity, courage, modesty, manliness, silence, deliberation, gravity, mercy, good manners, comradeship, um, camaraderie, I guess, and other similar qualities. They can be summed up as good character, husn al khuluk. Some of these qualities can be part of natural instinct and basic disposition in some people. Others do not have them and have to acquire them. However, some basic rudiments of them must exist in a person's natural disposition, as Allah willing, we will make clear, even when the face of Allah in the next world is not what is intended by these worldly qualities. They are still considered good character and virtues according to the consensus held by men of sound intellect. However, there is a disagreement as to the reason for people having these qualities. So it's kind of a, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's really kind of a deep introduction, but basically, what he's saying here is, um, among other things, but just basically it's that some virtues are wahbi, some virtues are innate. Some people are born with virtue. 
Wahbi from Al Wahhab. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the bestower of gifts, Al Wahhab. And some virtues are Kasbi, they can be acquired through discipline, disciplining the nafs. Right? So there's a virtue theory in, amongst our classical ulama. Ghazali has a virtue theory. Um, and it's, it's Aristotelian to a certain point. Um, so basically that, um, it's basically to, to fake it till you make it. It's called habitus in Greek, that if you want to acquire a virtue, let's say that some people are born with patience, some people don't have it. If you're born with it, it's from al-wahhab. Alhamdulillah, you have it. Um, everyone's born equal in the sense that they're all humans, but not everyone's created equal in that sense that they're exactly the same. There's some people, some people who are born into opulence and wealth. Some people are born into dire poverty. Some people have, um, uh, they're born and they're educated and they have incredible ta'deeb. They have like discipline and they have virtue. Um, some people don't. Uh, so in reality, everything is, is wahbi. Everything is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But basically, if you want to acquire a certain virtue, you have to fake it until you make it. <coughs> if you want to be patient, if you want sabr, when something happens, like a sadma, like a type of calamity, uh, act like a virtuous person. Act like a, um, like a uh, patient person. And if you keep acting like that, over time, it'll be sort of woven into your personality. You'll acquire it, right? Um, there's a hadith in Bukhari, a famous hadith, where the Prophet ﷺ was at the graveyard in Medina, al-Baqir, and he saw a woman crying at a grave, and she was kind of hysterical. And he said, uh, ittaqi wasbiri, ya amatullah, like, O maid servant of God, Fear God and be patient. And then uh, she was impatient. She didn't even turn around to see who it is. <laughs> so she said to him, Ilayka anni, like, get away from me. Like, go, get, get away from me. Uh, you've never been afflicted like this. So some of the muhaddithin say that her son had died. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ buried all of his children except for one. Right? And he knew that Fatima would die in six months. And he knew Hassan Hussein would also be martyred uh, as well. Um, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he just, he goes home, right? And then the woman, she finds out that, that it was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she goes and waits by his door. Um, and she says to him that, uh, you know, I'll be patient now. And the Prophet said to her, إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ صَدْمَةِ الْأُولَى أَوْ عِنْدَ أَوَّلِ صَدْمَةٍ that indeed true patience is at the first stroke of the calamity. That's true patience, right? And that's, that's the goal. So it's good that you're going to be, that's how we learn, right? But true patience, you can, if someone's a, a, a sabr or sabur, the way that you can tell is that something happens and immediately they have patience. That means they've acquired this virtue or they're trying to acquire this virtue. So they're acting like, a patient person, right? So that's how you acquire virtue. <clears throat> the difference with Aristotle then, between Ghazali and Aristotle, the method is somewhat the same, but the, the telos, the ghaya, the end, the aim is different. The aim for Aristotle is, uh, he calls it eudynomia, which is like living a fulfilled, happy life of contemplation to become a philosopher, that's the end. Uh, for Ghazali and others, it is proximity to the divine, is wilaya, is sainthood. That's, that's the goal, is that you mimic the ethos of the Prophet ﷺ because he's Habibullah, and by doing that, you become Habibullah. You become beloved of God, and you attain ranks of sainthood. That's the goal. In sainthood, we're using a sort of a more general, right, um, proximity to God. Not necessarily someone who can manifest karamat and things like that. Someone with good character. Someone who's in the, someone who 
may not even have a lot of knowledge as an average Muslim guy or, or woman, but uh, is striving to emulate the Prophet and their sincerity there, and they're constantly working on their khuluq, and they're constantly trying to acquire these virtues. It never stops. It, it continues to go. So the Prophet said, فَاسْبِرُوا حَتَّى تَلْقَوْنِ عَلَى الْحَوْضِ Keep being patient. And one of the meanings of patience is also perseverance. Keep persevering until you meet me at the hawd. That's when you can relax. But the dunya is going to be work. There's no point in the dunya where you just, oh, I'm, I'm good enough now. I'm good. Like Abdul Qadir Jilani when, the, when he had the dream and the light. And you're sheikh, you're, you're the great wali and there's no taklif on you, no more prayer for you. You've ascended, transcended the prayer. And he said, who are you? And he said, I'm your Lord. He said, no, you're a liar. You're the shaitan. Because the Prophet Sallallahu had to pray six times a day. The taklif is not removed from him on any of the awliya, but I've transcended taklif. It's ridiculous. Anyway, I think we can stop here, inshallah. So, for next week, we'll, so that was, that's the introduction, basically. Uh, we'll start section one, which is a preface, which is sort of a um, summary of what he's already said in chapter one. And in section two, he begins by talking about the khalq. So there's khuluq and khalq. The, the khuluq is the character of the Prophet Sallallahu The khalq is his physical manifestation, so his physical appearance, the physical appearance of the Prophet Sallallahu which is a sign of his nabuwa, the way that he physically looked. Inshallah ta'ala. Next time. Sakala khair wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam alhamdulillah wa alameen.